Yeah, good Sabbath, everyone. Welcome. We're uh, just want to remind you that we're having our uh, annual business meeting tomorrow, and I think we've we've got details worked out. I believe a link, uh, an email was sent out to that effect, and so we will plan on. We do in in that meeting. We do what we do in pretty much all the business meetings plus a little bit more so let's plan on that at that time all right well let's uh let's give thanks to god that we're here today let's pray our father as we come before you it's with uh knowing that it, it's because you call us to come that you have called us and saved us and made us your children, made us part of your family. And so, Father, we very much feel like family here as we come and as, as we worship you together. So bless this time. Guide us through this day. Thanks so much for Sabbath. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn today is uh, We Are the Light of the World, so go ahead and stand as uh, we sing this together. And I don't know the words very well, so forgive me. <laughs> Everything's so hard. <laughs> Our scripture today is Matthew 25, 31 through 46. So bear with me. I get nervous. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Won't that be wonderful to see? All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When did when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did, 
not do for one of the least of these you did not do for me. Then they will go away to the eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today, the Sabbath that you gave us. We rejoice in it. We rejoice in your scripture. And Lord, let us take the scripture to our heart and really think about it. This is our life here on earth. Amen. All right, our next hymn today will be This Is My Father's World. Uh, please stand if you would like to. Years ago, I heard somebody say, we all need to be concerned about the future because that's where we're going to spend the rest of our lives. You know, the Bible teaches that God has a great future plan for his people, uh, an eternal future that we will spend with him. We're encouraged to look forward to that time, to want it more than anything, and to believe that God will keep his promises. Now, earlier we heard one of the stories, parables, I guess, from um, Matthew 25, where Jesus, the king, told the righteous people to come and receive their inheritance. And of course, that's God's kingdom. The king even said that this kingdom has been prepared for them from the foundation of the world. That parable is a picture of what God has has uh, planned, has prepared for, and has promised for those who accept his gift of eternal life. Every Christian should be looking forward to this so much. I guess we can almost taste it, you know? And this is the main hope that we have as believers. But first, have you ever heard that on TV just before the commercial break? They will say, but first, this word from our sponsor or whatever. Now, you might decide to you know, get up and go do something else for the next three minutes, or you're going to have to just sit and listen to these sales pitches for beer and cars and deodorant and dog food before you can get on with the rest of the show. I guess you have to do it, because without the commercials, there wouldn't be any TV shows. Well, sometimes God says, but first, uh, please find Acts chapter 14 in your Bible. Acts 14. Actually, in the verse we're going to read, um, the words, but first, aren't there. But this is definitely that kind of verse. So let's read it. It's Acts 14, 22. I'm going to start reading with uh, verse 21. Acts 14, 21. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We must go through many tribulations, or sometimes translated hardships. You know, whenever I see the word we, it always makes me think of an old Lone Ranger joke. 
Uh, now, of course, some of you are too young to remember the Lone Ranger. He was a cowboy on, on a TV show, a Western, of course. His gimmick was that he wore a mask. You know, usually it was the villains who wore masks, but the Lone Ranger had a mask. He was the good guy, the hero. I never did know why he had the mask. And um, now, back then, TV cowboys always had, you know, somebody with them, like like a partner or, you know, sometimes called a sidekick. The Lone Ranger's sidekick was an Indian named Tonto. It was kind of unusual, I guess, for a white man and an Indian to be partners working together. But I guess that was another one of the show's gimmicks. Anyway, the joke goes, the Lone Ranger and Tonto are out riding on their horses one day when, when suddenly this very mean-looking gang of Indians rides up to them and surrounds them. It doesn't look good because these Indians have war paint on their faces. The Lone Ranger says, Tonto, we are in a lot of trouble. And Tonto says, What do you mean, we, pale face? So when Paul and Barnabas say, We must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God, what do they mean, we? Well, obviously, Paul and Barnabas themselves, but who else? Well, it's, it's got to be the people back then, right? Everybody knows that Christians in the first century had to suffer for their faith. As often as not, they were, they were harassed and persecuted, sometimes even killed, for no other reason than because they loved and served Jesus and believed that he was the Messiah. But we live in a free country, right? We have freedom of religion. We're allowed to believe in Jesus or any other God we might choose. And we're allowed to practice our beliefs however we want. And no one should hassle us for being Christians. I mean, isn't that the way it is? So it must be that Paul and Barnabas meant themselves, plus maybe a few other people, like people maybe that he was, that they were talking to in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, plus a few groups of Christians in, in the centuries since then. Every so often, some tyrant decides to take it out on a convenient target, and often that target is the Christians in his country. And in some places in the world, of course, this still goes on, but not in the good old USA. Christians are safe here, aren't we? Well, maybe, maybe 50 or 60 years ago, that was the way it was in this country. When I was a kid, you know, who would ever have thought that anyone would be giving American Christians a hard time? You know, government agencies, school boards, the Supreme Court. Can it happen here? Is it happening here? Apparently, it's happening more and more. We must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. So, what does it mean to enter the kingdom of God? What exactly is the kingdom of God? Well, a kingdom is any place where a king rules the people. Uh, so, God's kingdom is where he is king. The Bible talks about God's kingdom in, in several ways. Uh, Actually, this would be a whole nother study that would probably take the rest of the day, but here's just a few things. 
Jesus told people to repent because the kingdom of God was near. Now, this could mean a couple different things. This could mean that the kingdom was close by, and that was true because Jesus was there in person. And it could mean that the kingdom would start soon, and that was also true. In the Beatitudes, Jesus picked out two groups of people, uh, those who are poor in spirit and those who are persecuted. And for both groups, he said, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, and of course, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are the same thing. Now, being, being persecuted, that's one of those groups, right? That sounds like a hardship to me. I think there's a connection to our verse here in Acts 14. Another thing Jesus said is that in order to enter the kingdom, our righteousness has to surpass the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Well, really all that means is that we have to be perfect. Or to put it another way, to be saved. One more thing Jesus said. Boy, he talked about the kingdom quite a lot. Uh, one other thing he said was, the kingdom of God is within you or among you. Now that makes it sound like the kingdom is already here. And it's true. If we are Christians, we have already entered the kingdom. We're already part of it. Now, if that's true, then why does Acts 14.22, you still have that verse there? If we're already part of the kingdom of God, then why does Acts 14.22 make it sound like we haven't entered yet? If there is still going to be some tribulation before entering the kingdom, then Paul and Barnabas must have been talking about the future. First the hardships, then entering the kingdom. But I thought we already were in the kingdom. Well, Paul and Barnabas were right. Entering the kingdom of God here means basically heaven. This is talking about the kingdom as it really is, as it will finally be revealed, as we will experience it someday. It's like what the Bible sometimes calls the heavenly kingdom or the eternal kingdom. For every one of us, this is still in the future. We haven't really seen the kingdom of God yet, not the way God sees it, and not the way we're going to see it. Someday we will. Jesus said that he was preparing a place for us and that we will be with him where he is. In heaven, there's no sin, no pain, no tears, no death. It's a perfect place the perfect life for God's people. And the reason is because Jesus is king. The hope and the future of every Christian is to spend eternity in God's kingdom and to love every minute of it. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. According to Acts 14.22, there have to be some hardships some tribulation first. Before you go to heaven, you will probably go through some tough times. And let's get it clear that those tough times will come to people just for being Christians. Now, you might wonder, why did Paul and Barnabas have to go and ruin everything by talking about tribulation. Can't we just emphasize the 
positive message, the good news. Why talk about hardships? Well, for one thing, these guys had already gone through some hardships themselves. In chapter 13, they were thrown out of one city. Earlier in chapter 14, Paul was stoned and left for dead. Later on, there were a lot more of the same kind of thing. Sometime soon, not now, but you know, sometime, look at what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6. It's a list of things that he endured for Jesus. The Christian faith wasn't very popular in the Roman Empire. Many Christians suffered for believing in Jesus, and this has continued for most of the centuries since then in one place or another. Now, most of us were taught that our country was founded on Christian principles. Of course, part of that is the freedom to believe and to worship. And like I said earlier, you know, 60 years ago, the Christian faith and Christian people were still respected for the most part. But that's not the case so much anymore. I've even heard it said, actually, I've heard this years ago, that we now live in a post Christian era. The time of favor toward Christians is ending. The time for hardships is increasing. Now, you can blame whoever you want. Congress, uh, liberal judges, blame won't help. I think it all comes down to this. The devil knows his time is short and he's making all the trouble he can, with the result that our freedoms as Christians are slowly going away. It's, it's getting to where... Um, I remember a case in, uh, in California when we lived there where a high school teacher was not allowed to use the Declaration of Independence and other documents in his history class because those documents mention God. Our own Declaration of Independence. Now, the way I heard it, uh, he wasn't trying to teach the Christian faith. He, he just wanted to show that our founding fathers believed in God. You know, seems like you can say God in profanity, but not in faith. Newspapers and TV shows are allowed to mention God, I suppose, because they're not run by the government. But have you noticed most religions are, you know, usually treated with respect except one, and that's the Christian faith. Movies and TV shows usually show Christians as weird people who are completely out of it. And the news people love to run stories about Christians who do bad things. Uh, you know, these are all symptoms of, of society that is getting more and more hostile against Jesus and against his people. More, um, and of course, if this continues, you and I will go through many tribulations. But that's not as bad as it sounds. In fact, it's not bad at all. The good news in this verse is we will enter the kingdom, and entering the kingdom is worth the hassle. Uh, Sometime after this happened here in Acts 14, Paul wrote to the Romans, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that shall be revealed in us. That's the attitude that we need to have when we go through tribulations. 
and to know that God is still on the throne. Remember what we sang earlier? Uh, Though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. If you want to think of it this way, becoming a Christian is the easiest thing in the world, and it's the hardest thing in the world. It's easy because Jesus did everything to save us, and we just accept the gift. But it's hard because faith without works is dead. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow Jesus cannot be his disciple. The one who endures to the end will be saved. And we must go through many tribulations. Sure, it's hard, but we can do it. By God's grace, we can do it. Uh, please stand for our final hymn today, Crown Him with Many Crowns. <laughs>